There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Good afternoon. It's a lovely bright spring day out. I really ought to be out in the garden, but no, I'm inside and we're still working on our latest project, which is to play back um, old material, such as gramophone records, on contemporary equipment. And of course these are 78 RPM records, and we're not talking about 50s or 40s, we're, we've adopted circa 1930, and we've found a circuit um, which has got a couple of valves in it, and uh, we've got a speaker and the various bits, um, and um, I, I think it's not working too bad, but you will have to be the judge of that. But first off, let's have a look at the circuit. Here we are, and uh, it couldn't be simpler really, could it? Um, we've got a mouse, look. Uh, here's a pickup, which we'll examine it. Uh, there's a one meg pot, uh, which is volume control. And uh, this circuit has been copied from an actual unit. Um, and then, of course, we run into the, 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 the dreaded grid bias, because these are directly heated two volt valves. Um, so we must have grid bias, otherwise it doesn't work properly. Um, and then we notice we've got a resistor here, which is 50K, not 47K. You know, these are olden times, and we've got 0.5 of microfarad instead of um, 0.47, and stuff like that. But it's great, it's all part of the fun. Uh, this is a Mollard PM2 DX uh, general purpose triode, it uses a detector and a you know amplifier. Um, decoupling here, and um, now this is the interesting bit, we'll discuss that. That's the, the intervalve transformer. Uh, then we've got uh, a COSA 220PA here, which is actually an output triode, and the power involved, we'll look at that later. And here's a 20 Henry choke, which will uh, prevent the um, audio from going back up into the um, HT. Uh, and a 2 microfarad capacitor, coupling the output into a high impedance loudspeaker. And so really, there's, oh, and I've got a meter there just so that we can check the uh, current being drawn. So really, um, you know, what could be simpler? Here's that pickup. It's a nice bit of nickel plating on that. It's a BTH. Um, it was available in 1930, quite popular. There's two or three of them in the house, actually. We haven't covered this pickup yet. It got very good reviews uh, because it's it's got a very small light armature, so there's not so much resonance, uh, and of course uh, record wear is less because of the uh, compliance of the little armature. It's got this crown shaped thing, so it will fit on different size pickup arms, and it's got a couple of terminals on the back for you to connect the wires in. Uh, this is before the days of the screen cables just coming in, but they the twisted pairs fine for this. Some of these pickups have got an output of a, a volt or one and a half volts. Um, so uh, there we are. And in fact, um, how much was it? Here we are, and we can see that it was 27 and sixpence, uh, which is um, one pound 37 and a half pence for what that's worth. Um, it's it's certainly going to make a big bite out of an average weekly wage in 1930. Um, and of course, uh, the pickup is only the beginning of it. All this gear was extremely expensive because it was all fairly new cutting edge technology. And um, that's why people used their radio to play their records through. They didn't uh, buy a separate set of uh, expensive components, no. Here's our pickup, mounted and ready to go on our 1923 um, spring driven gramophone. And if we tilt down, uh, here is the amplifier itself, which we can give you the once over. Uh, the wire comes in to the volume control, goes into the first valve. This is the grid bias battery, uh, which is, um, I've actually shown it two separate ones on the, on the drawing, but it's, it's just the same battery. Um, then here is a the coupling capacitor into the uh, into valve transformer We meet at the back of course uh, Decoupling here and this is an original 50,000 ohm resistor. It's, it, it's jolly big. I've measured it It's about 49 and a half thousand ohms, which is great. This is the output choke. It's a massive thing 
and then here is um, the two microfarad, two one microfarad capacitors which will isolate the HT from the loudspeaker. There's a lead acid battery here which is 6 volts so there's a wire wound homemade resistor there to drop that 6 volts down to 2 volts which is what the valve needs. And in the background out of sight is an extremely messy um, power supply of about 140 volts DC uh, which hums a bit because it's only got one diode in the um, in the power supply. It should have four shouldn't it? These are the two microfarad capacitors that were in the original unit and um, of course when we tested them uh, the resistance was extremely high several mega ohms but as soon as we put you know 120 volts on them they began to leak and we got two or three no, a couple of milliamps running through them and it is rule one that no current shall pass through a capacitor um, which is why we have put modern ones in. Um, the resistor was fine <laughs> the solitary resistor uh, but the capacitors had uh, given up the ghost after uh, 90 years and who can blame them. Now we almost should say something about the intervalve transformer because if you remember on the circuit it's got two it's got a primary and secondary connected together and um, that's baffled me when I first let me show you the instructions that came with this unit when I bought it. Um, well, I don't take it for granted, it's a full-size wiring diagram, which is what you normally used, uh, had in those days. Is it upside down? No, it's not. It's the right way up. And uh, you work from that. And, of course, the connections are all screwed. And uh, it's infuriating when you screw up these terminals. They seem to have the magic property of even if you bend the wire round the right direction, when you screw them up, the, the screw terminal rejects the wire and you finish screwing it up and the wire is still loose. Uh, I don't know how they do that, but it tends to drive you mad. Yes, this business of the intervalve transformer, it, it, it's a very subtle thing. They use them, of course, because um, they would step up the voltage coming from the valve one. Uh, it would be stepped up still further um, to go into valve two, which is great. But they were always a bit unreliable components because the windings on them were so thin because of the, the high impedance uh, that they often failed. And um, I mean, I bought a job lot of, um, I think, eight of them uh, on eBay quite recently, and only five of them were working. But I accepted that. That was a good yield. You know, the, the tiny wire gets corroded. Um, but more than that, this uh, circuit diagram, which has got the primary and the secondary connected together, as I say, it baffled me until, thanks to www.americanradiohistory.com, which is a fantastic resource for um, US magazines, uh, thousands of them from decades, you know, many decades, and also hundreds and hundreds of UK wireless magazines, uh, which is fabulous. Um, I was browsing through them, I've been reading them a lot lately, and one, in one article I suddenly saw the interval transformer wired in different ways, and I seized on this, here was the answer. What they've done by connecting the primary and uh, secondary in series, they've converted that transformer into a tapped choke, uh, which means you could, it's more of a more versatile component. And the article described three or four different ways, almost any way you connect it round will give you a different sound. And I've tried it out and it's absolutely true. Um, uh, but but it was, was very counterintuitive when I stumbled across it. We must press on and get to the uh, last link in the chain, which is of course the loudspeaker. And uh, the, the gooseneck speakers were still around in 1930, they were fading away and they were being extensively replaced by cone speakers and although this speaker looks remarkably like a modern speaker it isn't because modern speakers are all moving coil loudspeakers now moving coil speakers were around uh, from the mid 1920s a US, another US invention Rice and Kellogg, two guys did it um, but for a long time they were very expensive people couldn't afford moving coil speakers for reasons which we you know don't have to go into but, but uh, they were expensive though they were better most people would use one of these which look which is the code look it but the drive unit is a horseshoe magnet uh, and and two coils and balanced in between 
those uh, the pole piece is, is an armature which is connected to the thing in the middle of the cone. And they're high impedance because valves were high impedance. This one here, uh, the resistance of the winding is DC resistance is 2000 ohms. So that's a, a lot more tiny fine wire. <laughs> so you know if, if they go open circuit it's a bit of a drag. And now the interesting thing here, so let me show you the other speaker. This is the speaker we're going to use, that you're going to hear, um, when I stop rabbiting, and it's just mounted on a little bit of wood, baffle board. Um, and I don't know whether you can see, but it's, it's been torn, the cone has been torn, it's got holes in it, and uh, it's in a pretty sorry state. But it does actually sound better than this one. It's got a better frequency response. And I, I think the reason, well, although this speaker is also louder than that one, um, but uh, this one has the better frequency response. I think it's because the mounting of the cone is very soft felt, whereas in this speaker it's, it's canvas and it's, it's either become rigid over the time, I don't know, but it's got a very poor um, upper frequency response. Here's just a short extract uh, played from a cinema record. It's a Columbia, made by Columbia in the UK in about 1928. And we're recording through the camera microphone, of course. And lastly, on this piece of paper, um, there is the question of what power are we using in this amplifier? And the answer is, uh, that's why I put the meter in, so <laughs> I've nearly forgot to use it. Um, well, there's 134 volts on the uh, anode of the output valve, and the, the uh, current consumption is 6 milliamps, that's for both valves. So let's pretend that all 6 milliamps goes through the output valve. Uh, and so since watts equals amps times volts, we've got 0.006 times 134, which is 0.8 of a watt. So the input is uh, 0.8 of a watt. Um, and of course valves were never noted for being terribly uh, efficient devices. So I would imagine that coming out uh, into the speaker, if we had, shall we say, 600 milliwatts, uh, I think that would be pretty good going. It's probably near a five, we've got half a watt. Um, so it's quite loud really when you hear it, but um, there's not a lot of power involved. Marvellous, isn't it? Well then, it's all over by the shouting. Uh, I'll leave you with one entire track, um, which is a record I happened to pull off the shelf the other day and played it, and I thought, oh, I like this one. And it was terrific. It, and it's by an American um, film actor who specialised in, in westerns, his name was Frank Braidwood, the cowboy baritone. And he must have come over to Europe more than once because he made some records for Parlophone in London, uh, which occasionally turn up. But he also made some for a cheap label called Piccadilly, which is like the equivalent of a one and sixpenny record. That's seven and a half pence. For what, for what it's worth. And uh, the tune is called uh, Tell Me More About Love. And uh, th they issued it under a pseudonym, probably because he was recording for Parlophone. It's Buddy Prince and his Seven Jewels. And um, they used that name for various singers, and uh, they, you didn't always get Seven Jewels. Sometimes there's only four or five of them. But there are seven on this record, and I think Braidwood has said, look, take a chorus in the middle and give it some razzmatazz. Uh, and they certainly do, because, you know, it's... Uh, 1929, I think they've sort of said, hey, let's play like we used to in 1924. I hope you like it. Thanks for watching and uh, see you next time. Bye.
up every night till 12 o'clock with a new girl. This is what I say. Ain't it nice and ain't it grand? Sit by me, hold my hand and tell me all about love. I don't know what to do. I can learn lots from you, so tell me all about love. I may be in all sense, but still I'm really, I've got a lot to learn. Oh, great love, really. Dim the lights, hold me tight, turn it out if you like, but tell me all about love. Don't hesitate and 